So uh, I want to begin by framing what I'm going to say because w w much of what I say will seem negative and harsh. Actually, no, it will be negative and harsh. So uh, I want to frame it by saying that I have a lifelong um, engagement with psychedelics. I first took them in 1966, and so um, it's been a long relationship. I can't imagine having lived without taking them. Jules really um, helped in, in many ways. I've seen some harm too, but so I'm not coming at this from a position of being hostile to psychedelics at all, but I feel that it's important for those of us who are psychedelic insiders and thought leaders in you know, the vanguard of psychedelia who are here at this conference to at least tackle some of the difficult issues. And I was very glad for that last presentation because it begins to tackle some of the hard issues, whereas all these other wonderful presentations were all about the wonderful potential, so I was afraid I was gonna be the only bummer here. And it probably will be a bummer, but you know, um, feel free to leave if you don't like being bummed out. Um, so um, let me begin by saying that um, in a, in a nutshell, let me give you the gist of my thesis, which is that most people here and most people in psychedelic subcultures, in my view, have an overly romanticized and utopian, even at times messianic, um, let's say, worldview about the role that psychedelics can have healing the collective, you know, that will come into a more compassionate and ecologically sensitive era. And while I think that psychedelics can greatly help individuals, I'm much more skeptical about this idea that they can be this magical force for healing society. And so I'm coming at this not from the perspective of individual health, but sociocultural, let's say ideological health for, of the psychedelic subcultures, for lack of a better term. Um, so before I get into all that, I just want to mention a few other issues that I was going to discuss more, but many other people have been discussing at this conference, which I'm very heartened about. I think ICERS is really going in the right direction. And one of those, of course, is the appropriation of indigenous practices by you know, people in the middle class first world. Um, and um, you know, I'm not uh, for banning cultural appropriation because human cultures have stolen and borrowed from each other from time immemorial, but the fact is that the irony is that the psychedelic subcultures tend to over-romanticize indigenous cultures, but at the same time they do very little if not, and if not nothing, to actually support the struggles of, of these peoples who, are, who invented the technology we're talking about and who are on the front lines of the battle to preserve biodiversity and often fighting for their own cultural and physical survival. So there are many people working on this who are also part of the psychedelic world and we've had here this weekend folks from Amazon Watch, Atosa Sultani and Lila Salazar-Lopez and my good friend Jeremy Narby working with Nouvelle Planète, a Swiss NGO, I mean, and Amazon Frontlines and Amazon Conservation Team. There are many you know, groups doing good work, some of whom have also been part of ayahuasca circles. But by and large, I've got to say that the overwhelming bulk of people in the psychedelic world don't do anything tangible or concrete in a serious way to actually help indigenous folks. So I'd like to see more of that discussed and serious ways to do that to be addressed. Another sociological problem, of course, has been discussed here as well, is we tend to love things to death and ayahuasca tourism is a big issue. It can have some benefits to some local people. It can also be very disruptive to the social order. And the epidemic of sexual abuse which um, Swelly referred to uh, in, in ayahuasca circles around the world, and I was really glad to see the Chacruna Institute present in this very room on that, but I'd like to see much more discussion of that. I think that's a critically important issue that is too often swept under the rug. So, but I'm not here to talk about any of those things. I'm here to talk about something else, which is that if you look at the landscape, and I've had a lot of contact with people in the psychedelic world for many, many decades, and. I've got to say, the, the majority of them seem to me to suffer from a, a wide range of half-baked ideas of conspiracy theories, strange, uh, you know, unfounded ideas about ancient cultures and archaeology, uh, you know, they tend to believe more than the average citizen that there are aliens among us, you know, interacting with human beings. They, you know, I mean, uh, two classic examples that, that illustrate this are the 2012 hoopla around end times, which very few people in the counterculture were pointing out was basically ridiculous. And an earlier iteration, the 1987 Harmonic con Convergence, a similar um, sort of mass delusional episode in the counterculture and the psychedelic world. Um, so, you know, uh, now I want to be clear, 
you know, a lot of people in the secular world are interested in occultism and esoteric philosophies of all types. There are serious thinkers who engage with these domains, but I've got to say that the overwhelming majority of people I've run into in the psychedelic world are far from rigorous thinkers, and their zeal is only matched by their lack of sophistication in how these tackle these complex uh, philosophies. Anyway, um, so why, uh, two questions come up, why? Why are so many weird beliefs so prevalent in the psychedelic, psychedelic subcultures, and does it matter? So my fundamental answer to why, and it's a complicated question, but I'll give it a simplified version, is that we have to look at the nature of psychedelic substances and at the nature of our own culture. And this collision of very powerful tools that release material from the unconscious, both the personal and the collective unconscious, and an extremely psychically damaged landscape. I mean, let's face it, the modern world is rife with anxiety, neurosis, um, and, you know, narcissism in epidemic proportions. And so, you know, we talk about set and setting, but the context of the, you know, the use of these substances is not, you know, in a, in a void state. It, it's in a particular culture at a particular time in a particular place. Now, we look to shamanic cultures because they learn to navigate these very tricky psychic domains for, for centuries and millennia. Um, but, you know, we don't have... It's really impossible, I think, to have the same level of control that a pre-colonial shaman might have had. For, they, they came from much more coherent cultures. We may live longer, we may be more materially comfortable, but we're much more psychically damaged, we're much less embodied. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's right for us to try to learn from those cultures, but I think we have to be realistic about the level of control. And even shamans will tell you that um, you know, you can't fully control the experience. I mean, that's uh, even the most experienced shaman. That's kind of the point. It's one of the interesting things about psychedelics, unlike pharmaceutical drugs, where you will fall asleep or you will do this. I mean, there are exceptions to those things, but they're unpredictable, which is p part of their charm uh, on some level. Um, so, now I want to be clear. I don't think that psychedelic subcultures generate most of the silly ideas sweeping the world at the right the far right and even, sadly, sectors of the left are generate as many, if not more, conspiracy theories and silly ideas. But I'm part of the psychedelic community. I'm concerned about this. And why? You know, because does it matter? Okay, so this is an interesting question. If the psychedelic world remains a niche, I mean, yes, it's dynamically growing, especially the ayahuasca subculture is rapidly growing around the world. But if it remains a niche, another subculture among many, many subcultures, you know, honestly, it doesn't matter that much. Yes, silly ideas are annoying. Yes, charismatic, you know, power-hungry psychedelic gurus can be dangerous to their adepts, no question. But by and large, as a large cultural force, then maybe it doesn't matter. But if psychedelics and the ayahuasca you know, movement, for lack of a better term, are as significant and important as most people at this conference want to believe or do believe, then it does matter. Because we're at a, a you know, a critical point in, in terms of an existential civilizational crisis, as many people this weekend have discussed. And, um, you know, we need every person of goodwill with compassion and, and um, you know, who cares about social justice and about preserving conditions conducive to life in the biosphere, to work constructively to, to try to face these, these and the rise of neo-fascist movements around the world. We need everybody on board. And right now, I have to say that I see so many black holes that people in the psychedelic world, it's less evident here because, again, this is a vanguard, but if you look at the rank and file of, of psychedelic users, I, I see them getting into all kinds of, you know, conspiracy theories and diffusing ridiculous ideas. And this actually detracts from effective mobilizations to really deal with the problems we have. Um, so, um, you know, what is to be done? Well, I think ICERS is really pointing things in the right direction. I think a lot of discussion has been stimulated around some of these issues. But I think that we, the thought leaders in the psychedelic world, need to be a little more honest about the ideological landscape of the entire movement and to begin to try to nudge things in saner directions to the extent possible. If not, honestly, the psychedelic movement, instead of a source of global healing, will just be more ideological noise. Anyway, that's it.